Okay, if we are all sitting comfortably, let's begin. Um, welcome to the Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness Lecture Series here at the wonderful October Gallery. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a, a regular lecture series, we've been going for about four years now, and uh, we meet up once uh, every last Tuesday of the month, more or less, and uh, various talks on various themes, anything under the umbrella of ecology, cosmos and consciousness, particularly psychedelics and that kind of thing. Uh, just give a quick plug to some of the events coming up. Next month we have Gary Lackman coming along to give a talk about cosmic consciousness and the quest for Hermes Trimagestus, if I can uh, say that correctly. Um, and the month after that, I'm very pleased to just discover this very day, in fact, that Robin Carl Harris, where are you Robin? He's here somewhere. He's going to come and give a talk for us at the end of April about his research uh, doing uh, neuroimaging and uh, psilocybin. And then Jim May as well, in fact. I had myself in a brain scanner yesterday as part of his research uh, project. That was quite interesting. Um, ben will tell us more about this research anyway. Um, so one of the things we do here at the gallery, uh, this, well, this lecture series is uh, we organised a conference last year, co-organised it with some colleagues at the University of Kent and uh, my good friend here, Ben Sessa. Uh, it was uh, called Breaking Convention, a multidisciplinary meeting on psychedelic uh, consciousness. And we're planning to do another one next year at the University of Greenwich. Just for interest, some of you may have been to that conference last year. I'm just plugging some of the posters on sale downstairs. They're a, li a limited edition art print if you're interested. So you can grab one of those if you were there. Final work as well is just for my friend Johnny, uh, who is a Tesla gallery and he's got his own exhibition. Uh, you can grab a fly downstairs on the 9th of March. His work called Apophenia. So that's it with the plugs. So without further ado, I'll introduce, uh, we didn't need much introduction, but my uh, good friend Dr. Ben Sessa is a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I don't know quite how to, where you put the pauses in that, <laughs> but I think I've got it about right. And, uh, he also uh, has had a long-standing interest in, in psychedelic research and uh, psychedelic renaissance and reintroducing uh, psychedelic psychotherapy, uh, particularly in this country. So he's going to come and talk to us about that. He's also my co-director co on the uh, Breaking Convention. So please warm welcome for Ben Sessa. Great, thank you. Um, cheers, Dave. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, this is working well. I feel like Kylie. Um, okay, so brilliant. This is really lovely to see some of the people here. This is like a success, whatever happens now. So um, it's really great to come back here. Thank you, Dave, for this opportunity. Um, I've been following Dave's um, ecology and consciousness lectures uh, carefully, and there hasn't been much on MDMA, but a lot of the classical hallucinogenic psychedelics have been well represented. So it's good to have some, some talking on MDMA tonight. Um, it's a homecoming for me because I went to college just all around here at UCL as a medical student. So um, I don't think I appreciated it at the time. It was all a bit of a blur, these streets, but it's nice to come back here and see it all today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about 3,4 um, methylene dioxymethamphetamine tonight. And I hope to learn something from you all because it's a complicated subject and I am a beginner in this subject. But um, I'm hoping that there are some experienced people in the audience who can tell me all about MDMA and ecstasy and we'll all learn from each other because that's what this is all about with this uh, current psychedelic renaissance that's going on at the moment. So the, the main talk is really about this, the idea that if you were to invent a drug that perfectly mimicked all the conditions you want for psychotherapy, it would probably look like MDMA. And this is a very... Uh, fortuitous experience that we have this drug and it's about the politics and the journey and why have we not used it up till now and uh, let's start doing the research and see if we can start using it. Um, because the viewpoint that I'm coming from is that as a clinical doctor it's all about developing effective safe treatment regimes for patients. Um, I've seen people commit suicide through untreated PTSD um, this PTSD is a very complicated disorder and it uh, is a killer in a good proportion of people who have that diagnosis and after decades and decades of treatments we don't have good treatments for 
a significant portion of people with treatment resistant PTSD. So this is a, a subject that is crying out for a good clinical approach and uh, let's see if MDMA can help. So a very brief introduction about what are psychedelic drugs. Um, I've tried to explain to somebody earlier what does, it, what does the psychedelic experience feel like and uh, I kind of kept stumbling because it's very difficult to explain what it feels like. Probably be easier to play it on the piano than to <laughs> describe it. Um, so uh, we, we can classify psychedelic, I won't even try and explain psychedelic experience, but we'll go straight to the science. So different ways of classifying psychedelic drugs. We talk about classical psychedelics, and that's this group of uh, LSD, psilocybin, dimethyltryptamine, and mescaline. These are all potent 5 ht 2 a receptor. Um, actually, they're not potent, they're partial agonists, 5 uh, ht 2 a receptor. Um, and those are what we call classical psychedelics. Then we've got this group that are called uh, the entactogens, or sometimes the empathogens, depending on uh, whose definition you use. Um, they are all potent serotonin receptor and dopamine receptor agonists. Um, the most famous of that is MDMA, but there's a whole load of them. They're all based around the structure of phenethylamine, um, 2CB, 2CI, 2CT7. Um, there's a really good um, recipe book if you're interested in making these called the Ticar, which has hundreds of these uh, different phenethylamines in it, um, Picar rather, has hundreds of these different recipes in it for all of those uh, phenethylamine based entactogens. Um, and then there's another two groups that are. Yeah? Yeah, it's good Okay, it's a bit of a dance, maybe. No. Um, uh, so we've got dissociative anesthetics, which have uh, psychedelic properties as well, and we can group these into those that are antagonists of the NMDA receptor. Um, it's important here to recognise that NMDA has nothing to do with MDMA, which is a completely different um, idea. And those that are both based around the kappa opioid receptor, um, ibogaine and salvia. So I'm not going to be talking about most of these drugs tonight. I'm going to be concentrating on MDMA. This is a little bit of a background on psychedelics themselves. Um, another way to broadly classify psychedelic drugs are um, those that are based around the structure of tryptamine and those that are based around the structure of phenethylamine. Now, both tryptamine and phenethylamine are <coughs> common um, brain chemicals that are common in all parts of the brain and the, and the rest of the body. And um, the psychedelic drugs, some of them are extremely closely related to these different um, chemicals, which has led a lot of researchers to suggest that we have in our brains endogenous psychedelic chemicals that are released um, during peak experiences, mystical or religious experiences, non-drug induced religious or, uh, religious or mystical experiences. So there are, some of these drugs are uncannily close to these endogenous brain chemicals. So if we got tryptamine at the end there, serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine is tryptamine with uh, a hydroxy group in the fifth part of the benzene ring there. So, uh, and then all you do is add a dimethyl group to the other end and you've got DMT, which is one of the most powerful psychedelic substances you can imagine. And it's incredibly close to an endogenous brain chemical, which really does add a lot of weight to the suggestion that we maybe do have endogenous chemicals in our brain that produce spontaneous psychedelic experiences. And then we've got psilocybin, LSD, ibogaine. And MDMA here is based around the structure of phenethylamine. So it's 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine. So it's got these um, dioxy groups on the third and fourth position of the benzene ring there. Um, so that's another way of classifying psychedelic drugs. Um, Again, just by way of a brief introduction, um, psychedelic drugs in their plant and fungi form, form the basis of every religion on the planet, I would come out and say that. Um, there's very well documented evidence around the, the use of psychedelic plants in the developing human culture all over the world. So we've got their uh, peyote cactus, um, which contains mescaline, it's, uh, it's native American use. We've got the Amelita muscari mushroom, classic mushroom there, which has been associated, linked with a lot of different um, birth of different religions, and it's quite contentious. So um, this is uh, this one here is the goddess Demeter uh, giving out this uh, sacrament here, which was uh, associated with the Elysian mystery mystery rites. 
We've got Ibogaine ceremonies up there. This uh, bubbling pot here is um, that one on there is an uh, Amazonian ayahuasca. Psilocybin mushroom, cannabis, and its association in West Africa, uh, in East Africa with Rastafarian religion. And uh, of course, the Indian sadly use of cannabis is well documented. And of course, Christianity itself is not immune from its early origins, um, quite possibly involving psychedelic drugs. But that's all a different story, because what we're talking about is MDMA. Um, so there is a very rich history of psychedelic therapy use with the drug LSD. Um, LSD was discovered by Albert Hoffman in 1938, and its psychedelic properties were discovered in 1943, and that spawned a whole revolution of interest in psychiatry. In the late 50s, early 60s, it was really thought that LSD could be the next big thing in psychiatry. Um, now that's another talk altogether, which I'm not going to talk about, but what happened with LSD was it all collapsed, not for, socio, not for medical reasons, but for socio-political reasons. Um, for those psychiatrists and therapists that were using LSD in the 50s and early 60s, they were really pleased with the results. It was a very positive drug that had some great uh, um, opportunities in psychiatry to treat neurotic disorders. But, as we all know, the uh, psychedelic 60s drug revolution took over, the drug leaked from the medical community, the drug was banned, became public enemy number one, and um, when it was banned in 1966, that was a very effective move by governments to halt medical research in its tracks, but a very ineffective way of stopping recreational use, which spiralled out of control thereafter. So that's the story for LSD. And um, there's been something of a hiatus in psychedelic research in the last 30 years since the whole uh, the first psychedelic interest took off in the 60s um, until very recently, and that's that's where we are today with um, the, the renaissance of interest in psychedelic <coughs> research in the last few years. So um, I'm going to talk about the timeline for MDMA and how we got to the point where we are today, but just. As a brief introduction about what is MDMA, so it's a serotonin agonist. It is uh, associated with a recreational drug um, which uh, used to be called ecstasy. Um, I'm not quite sure what ecstasy is now. It's a bit of a meaningless concept. It's a pill, whatever that is. Um, it is a shorter experience than uh, LSD. It's a two to five hour experience. Um, it is less intense from a perceptual or distorting point of view to LSD. It is almost always pleasurable. And that's a really important aspect of it. Um, I'd, I'd say about 99.8% of studies anywhere will demonstrate that subjects experience pleasure with MDMA. There's a chap called Andy Parrott who's managed to publish the only studies anywhere that demonstrate a negative effect with MDMA. So it is, and that's quite unique as a drug, as a psychotropic drug in psychiatry. It's second really only to opiates, like morphine and heroin, or a drug that you can take and will cause pleasure every time in every user, on almost every circumstance. Um, a very important <coughs> aspect of any psychedelic drugs is this concept of set and setting, which is that the total experience, the psychedelic experience, is very much a product of the environment and the mindset in which you take the drug. Um, and that is true for MDMA, um, but certainly less so than for LSD. LSD is a, a drug experience that could go one way or the other and is deeply influenced by set and setting. MDMA is also influenced by set and setting, we'll see this with the studies. Um, but, as I said, it's an invariably pleasurable experience, which is a really positive thing when we're looking at it as a clinical tool. Um, it has uh, these empathogenic qualities, and this is really important. It seems to spontaneously improve a sense of empathy between the user and the therapist. It allows you to connect on a very deep personal and bodily level with the therapist. It allows you to access repressed and difficult and painful memories and allows you to explore those memories in depth without being overwhelmed by the negative feelings 
that go with exploring painful memories. And I'll talk about this in a bit more detail, but that's probably its most important psychotherapeutic effect, um, among others. Um, it is physiologically safe in proposed therapeutic applications. Now that is the statement that some people may find contentious. We've heard so much about the neurotoxic damage of ecstasy, and I'm going to concentrate on that quite a lot. Um, but I will put my head on the line here and say it is safe in clinical applications. There's really no evidence to suggest that doses and patterns of doses that we're proposing in clinical therapy need to cause any physical problems at all. But I welcome some debate on that. Um, and crucially, that final point, from a clinical point of view, it's much easier to manage than LSD. Um, LSD is an immensely useful substance in psychotherapy, but the degree of training and control that you need in the therapists managing LSD, I would say is a notch above what you would do with LSD, with, with MDMA. And I think this is borne out in the recreational use as well. People who have used MDMA recreationally will tell you that it's generally a much easier going experience. So all these things adding up together make it a, a useful tool for psychotherapy. Cameron is online. <laughs> um, He's not here though, that's a shame. Okay, so MDMA, where did it come from? MDMA was, it was synthesized by a German company Merck in 1912 and patented as an appetite suppressant. Um, it never went into production. It, uh, I don't know why not, maybe the war got in the way, but it didn't happen and it was never marketed. Interesting to think what the First and Second World Wars might have been like had it been marketed. Because um, it, was, it was developed by the military and it was the purposes it could have been that kind of present for use on the front line by soldiers. But yeah, it is interesting to imagine them all leaving. Um, it sort of got lost at that point. Um, it briefly emerged again in the 50s when the CIA were doing this uh, MK Ultra. Um, project which looked at a load of different psychotropics, especially LSD. They did look briefly at MDMA. The purpose is they were, this is the US military, were trying to find a drug that would be a truth serum to use on their prisoners. Um, so briefly, uh, briefly sort of uh, put its head up there. And then in the 60s, it was strangely absent from the whole 60s um, recreational drug scene. Um, there was a little bit of use of MDMA, M MDA, which is methylene dioxyamphetamine, which has some qualities to MDMA, but it's not, it's not quite the same. A little bit of use of that um, in the 60s, but generally it wasn't taken up by the hippies, um, who preferred LSD as their, as their typical choice. Um, but what did happen in 1967 is this chap, um, Alexander Shulgin, the, the chap at the top there, he was introduced to the drug by a graduate student of his. Uh, uh, um, I won't go into the whole Shulkin story, but it's an interesting story. He was introduced to the drug. He began exploring its use. Shulkin set up a really interesting study group in the late 60s and 70s, in which he, he was a chemist. Um, he would make, on a monthly basis, a new phenethylamine compound each month, and then test it on his friends in the study group, and they'd write about it. It's a great book. Um, you should read the book. Um, so he was using it. He called it his low-cow martini. Um, and it was pretty small usage of people that were using it in the 60s and 70s. Um, and then in 76, he, uh, Shulgin patented a new synthesis technique, which made it a lot easier to make. It was a difficult drug to make with the original Merck um, method of synthesis. Um, Shulgin developed a new synthesis. He showed it to his friend, Leah Zeff, who was a psychotherapist. Now, Zeff was a psychotherapist in the 60s using LSD. Um, and like a lot of the psychotherapists in the 60s, Zeff and a lot of his colleagues were very disheartened when LSD was, was banned in the late 60s and the clinical research stopped. Um, so when Zeff was introduced to MDMA by Shulgin, he thought, wow, here is the new LSD. It was better than LSD for all those reasons I described. Zeff started using it with his patients. Um, started, he traveled all over the world, all over Europe and the States, introducing it to people for psychotherapy. And in incidentally, a lot of those people, hundreds of those people, <laughs> went on to be psychotherapists themselves. So it, it, in the late 70s and early 80s, it was growing in stature, still amongst a very small number of people, a lot of them on the west coast of America, it seems to be that way, um, using MDMA psychotherapy. And 
by 1985, we're beginning to see a couple of small anecdotal case studies um, were published around its use. So nothing like the proper double-blind placebo-controlled study, but anecdotal case studies of its use. Um, but what also started happening, just like LSD, in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, MDMA started turning up in nightclubs. Um, this is interestingly around the time, it was in Dallas, where Dallas, as we all know, in the 80s was this fake lamps place, lots of people using cocaine. People started, the police started getting seizures of this weird tablet, which people were calling Adam. Um, and it started growing in popularity in the mid 80s, uh, the early 80s there in Dallas, where it was more popular than cocaine in some cases. Um, another important move when it comes to the European market was, um, this is uh, Bhagwan Rajneesh, uh, this is uh, Osho, he's an uh, Indian guru chap who uh, uh, was uh, in the States, had a commune in the States. Um, in the late 80s, mid 80s, they were ejected from their commune in Oregon, and they moved to, I, well, they spread out around the world, but a significant proportion went to the island of Ibiza, and they were using MDMA as part of their psychospiritual development, and that took the island, took the drug to this little um, unknown Balearic island, Ibiza. Um, I stayed at the Osho complex for a month in India years ago. It wasn't as exciting as I hoped it <laughs> So we're moving on now. We're coming up to 1985. And um, in 1985, the authorities had had enough. There were too many reports of um, the drug turning up recreationally. And the uh, DEA put, a, put out this emergency ruling to have it banned. There was a backlash by the psychotherapists who said, no, this has medical uses. Uh, they put a case against it. The judge ruled that it does have medical uses and it should be Schedule 3, not Schedule 1. Um, but the DEA overturned that and put it in an emergency Schedule 1 class where it's stayed ever since. So it's a massive twisting of the law, really. And uh, it doesn't say much for the jurisdiction, does it, that it's been an emergency drug since then. Um, but what happened was... Uh, it, this created a, a big stir amongst the psychotherapy community that were using it. And a uh, chap, Rick Doblin, oh, there was a picture of him early on in the previous slide, he set up an organisation called the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And in its early days, MAPS was set up primarily <coughs> to push, the, to fight this legislation against MDMA. Um, because they were in a catch-22 situation, it was a scheduled drug because there was no decent data to say it's safe. But no one could get a license to do any studies because there was no decent data. So the DEA said, you, how do you know it's safe? You haven't done any studies. So Max would say, let's do a study. You can't do a study because it's not licensed. So it was a catch-22. And it's taken 35 years since then to finally get an MDMA published study, which is where we're now at. So, um, so meanwhile, as with LSD, the popularity recreationally grew massively. Medical research stops overnight, but the recreational use grows. Um, in 1987, um, famously, Danny Rampling and uh, Paul Ogenfold had a holiday to Ibiza where they discovered the uh, Osho community using MDMA. They took it to the dance floor, they brought it back to um, the UK, set up a club in South London called Shoom, very popular. By 1988, we call this the second summer of love. MDMA is massive, the whole concept of illegal rapes kicks off. Um, in sort of two broadly different areas, we've got the Manchester scene going one way with indie music and then using ecstasy. We've got the dance house club scene and that's going the other way using ecstasy. Ecstasy is everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, in 19, by 1993, rave was a mainstream thing. Um, the Shaman had their hit Ebenezer Good on top of the pops. That was kind of the end of underground empty made, well and truly in the arena by then. Um, Interesting, it's important to note, between 1988 and 1993, there was a brief reopening of a window of experimental research, uh, legitimate MDMA research in Switzerland, which spawned a, a whole generation of psychotherapists using MDMA and other psychotropic drugs for their psychotherapy. And uh, very pleased that we got two of them in the audience tonight, and uh, we're going to have a chat with them later. Um, but basically, what we then enter between 93 and until a couple of years ago is a real hiatus, a real black hole. MDMA was public enemy number one. It was, this is the time where we had some very high profile young people dying from ecstasy use. It was impossible. Rick Doblin and Michael Mithoffer were struggling to get their study off the ground and then meeting barrier after barrier. Um, 
And then, in the last few years, it's really opened up. And in 2009, um, David Nutt, uh, whilst working for the ACMD, which is the government-based committee looking at the risks and safety profiles of different recreational drugs, um, he was commissioned to write a report on ecstasy. I submitted two papers to that. We were very clear that ecstasy or MDMA have positive clinical uses and it shouldn't be a class A or schedule one substance. We were really clear about that. He submitted the results. The government read it and said, oh, that's not what we had hoped to hear. <laughs> um, David was outraged and went to the press and wrote a famous article about equity or that, um, he called it equity, that uh, MDMA ecstasy is safer than horse riding. He got in loads of trouble with the government, but he stuck to his guns and he just said, no, this is, you asked me as a government expert to, com you commissioned me to write an evidence-based report and that's what I've done and these are the results. I'm sorry that they do not fit with your agenda, but these are the results, that's what my job is. And they sacked him. So that was 2009. Um, and then in 2010, Michael Mayhoff finally completes his PTSD study for MDMA, and we finally, 35 years after the banning in 85, have hard data on the table about the safety and efficacy of MDMA psychotherapy. Um, where are we going from here? Uh, I'm hoping to start this study with MDMA in the next 12 months, which will be fantastic for this country. Um, as for what's happening recreational with kids these days, I'm not quite sure. Um, this stuff, plant food, they call it bubble. I mean, if you ask kids on the streets now, they don't even, they, they know they're not buying MDMA. They just call it a pill or a powder. I mean, bubble, the word bubble. If there's young people, they might know more than me. I mean, it may sound very old. But the concept that you just want a stimulant for the night, and it could be anything. And you buy it online, and then you write a blog about it. You know, it's, it's not MDMA. Um, so that's where we are at the moment. You're keeping up. Please shout out if you want to. So I'm just going to go back a little bit to the golden years of MDMA therapy. Um, and this is when Zeth was using it. Because what's really important is that when we talk about therapy and psychedelic drugs, we're not talking about taking this drug every day, like you take an SSRI antidepressant. It's not that you take LSD or MDMA day in, day out for months and months and months to treat your mental disorder. This is about psychotherapy. It's not about psychopharmacology. It's interesting, people get really excited about this and they talk about drugs, drugs, drugs. Psychedelic therapists are principally psychotherapists and the drug is used a very small number of times as part of a course of non-drug psychotherapy. So all of the studies that we're looking at are 12 to 20 sessions of, drug, of, of um, psychotherapy with the patient, of which two or three are assisted by the psychedelic drug. And that's really important to understand when people think, you know, the idea of psychedelic drugs as clinical treatments, you're not popping a pill every day, far from it. Um, and this is, this is the work that came out of Zeth and his work in California. And what was, where it was found to be really useful is in neurotic problems, relationship problems, couples therapy, and particularly post-traumatic stress disorder. So I'm going to just have a little look at post-traumatic stress disorder, which I'm sure people have heard of. So, all psychiatrists have experience with PTSD. You could almost argue that there isn't a psychiatric problem that doesn't have a trauma-based cause. Um, as a child psychiatrist, I can't help thinking it all happened in the first three years. Um, it's obviously not quite as fatalistic as that, but thankfully that is quite often the case, so I have a job. But post-traumatic stress disorder is a very broad term, and until about 10 years ago in psychiatry, we really, we really framed PTSD as a severe, life-threatening, catastrophic event, like a single rape, a car accident, an earthquake, a volcano, something, a one-off, discrete, episodic, catastrophic, life-threatening event that happens to you. We're now seeing things much more broadly, and PTSD is being applied in psychiatry to a much broader range of problems. In child psychiatry, I use the term complex PTSD all the time to refer to children who've been consistently emotionally, sexually, physically abused or neglected during their childhood. So, um, it doesn't have to be a life-threatening event. A single episode of rape as a child by a caregiver that happens again and again and again over many years 
develop, you develop the same syndromic problem as PTSD. So what's happening in PTSD is that you've got this catastrophic psychological traumatic event or events. And what is thought is happening that there is a lack of integration and the way in which memories are stored and processed and integrated for that event immediately afterwards has profound effects on those memories staying where they should be in the brain. So I, the, the analogy I use with patients is, if you think of a memory, a memory is a multimodal sensory event, yeah? A memory is a smell, touch, taste, sound, feelings, emotions, so it's all of those. So if you have a memory, it's, there's a little bit of all of those. It's not just a piece of information, it's all of the sensory stuff that goes with it. And what's very, very important for the processing of memories is sleep and uninterrupted sleep. And in sort of layman's terms, when we sleep, what we do is we categorise and pigeonhole our day's memories into all the right places. And they are then stored. And we can access them later in life. We can come back to them and go, I remember that. I remember what it smelled like, what it tasted like, what it sounded like, who I saw. And you can take these memories out when you want them and put them back. With PTSD, it's like all of those letters are not in the right pigeonholes. They're scattered on the sorting room floor. And you trip over them and they come back to you. They re-emerge when you don't want them. They, have, they flash back. You're re-experiencing them. You're sitting there, getting on with your day, and suddenly your weight, 20 years earlier, comes flashing into you. And you experience it in full sensory modality. You smell it. You touch it. You can feel the scratch of the assailant's beard on your face, the smell of his aftershave. And that's what these re-experiencing phenomena are like for PTSD. And these are called dissociative episodes. People go into this kind of dreamlike state where they detach completely from what's going on around them and they enter, they revisit the traumatic experience. And this happens at night in the form of nightmares, happens during the day in the form of flashbacks. The person begins to avoid cues that remind them of the event. High levels of depression and anxiety and fear. High levels of arousal, high levels of what we call hypervigilance, twitchiness, agitation. Um, and associated with that is high levels of drug use, alcohol use, self-harm, and a significant number of cases of suicide. So this is, how, this is why PTSD is such an important disorder in psychiatry and why we need a treatment for it. So it's common, 6 to 10%. It's very disabling. The treatment for PTSD, traditionally, is such a hot pot of different treatments, which, in a way, illustrates how poorly we're managing it in psychiatry. So, for, to treat PTSD, you can take an antipsychotic medication, an antidepressant, you can take an anxiolytic medication, you can take sleeping tablets, you can have ECT, you can be sectioned into hospital. We do anything, we flow anything with PTSD. Um, and there's an evidence base for all of these treatments. And the, the underlying treatment for PTSD, for trauma, is, as you might imagine, it's revisit the trauma in a safe therapeutic environment, talk about it, overcome it, learn to relax, get it out of your system, and then you can move on. And so that makes sense, and that's called trauma-focused psychotherapy. Tell me about your rape. Oh, well, there I was, I was 12 years old, he came into the room, and it was like this, tears, pain, sadness, I want to run away, sit there, let's breathe, let's get through it. Week after week you get through it, and you overcome it, you put those letters back into the place where they belong. You can still access those memories, but you can access them when you want them. The trouble is that for a significant minority, 25% of cases of PTSD, this doesn't work. They cannot do this trauma-focused psychotherapy, because when they're asked to revisit those memories, they are so overwhelmed with this negative affect that they just dissociate, and they can't go there. Now, PTSD has been very closely associated with combat. Um, in the First World War, they called it shell shock. I'm not sure what they called it in the Second World War, but we call it PTSD now. Um, very high rates of PTSD, and that's a staggering figure, that um, more people die from suicide than in the combat. That actually, I was reminded the other day, probably refers more to the Falklands conflict than Iran and Iraq. Uh, Iran, um, maybe Iran too. Um, Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> Although I guess the data is not back from Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan about who's going to commit suicide, but I reckon it will be high. 
American military spends $50 billion a year on disability payments to returning soldiers with PTSD. So, if we're going to invent a drug to treat PTSD, trauma focused therapy, what qualities would it have? You'd want it to be short acting, because you want it to work in a single session. You don't want people zoned out of their heads at the end of the session. You want it to not be a dependent drug. You don't want it to be a drug that you don't become addicted to. There's no evidence that you can become addicted to MDMA. Um, no physical addiction. Uh, anything that's pleasurable, like golf or opera, has a dependence quality. You might want to do it again, but it's not a physical dependence. Um, it's non-toxic at therapeutic doses. It reduces feelings of depression. It increases feelings of closeness. It raises arousal to allow you to be motivated to take part in the therapy. But it also, paradoxically, at the same time, relaxes you. So you have this reduced type of vision. That's a very unique quality of MDMA. No other drugs and psychotropics do that. A drug that I call it um, uh, restful stimulation. That you're stimulated and you're chilled at the same time. A very unusual property. Um, and it has some effect on the two A receptors that as LSD does, which allows you to look at problems in a new way, with a, a, a look at entrenched problems in an innovative, novel way. So this is an important slide, it's a busy slide, but for the psychopharmacologists out there, it's important because it's about the receptor profiles. So MDMA has a very strong uh, affinity in, for, for serotonin, and that's where in HT 1A and 1B, We've got the low, the low mood, the depression, reduction, anxiety, increased self-confidence, euphoria. This is why ravers take it recreationally. So that's all the euphoric ecstasy bits of it. It also has an effect on the two A receptors, the same as LSD, and that's this alteration in perception of meaning. It, gives, it allows you to think laterally, new ideas. It has an effect on dopamine and uh, norepinephrine, which increases your level of arousal and alertness increases your stimulation and allows you to engage with the therapy. It paradoxically has an increased alpha-2 activity which causes relaxation, calmness, so you're not overwhelmed by the activity. And at the hypothalamus it has this weird effect on the release of oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone that's released in the brain, it's released very strongly in the brains of breastfeeding mothers, where it increases the empathy and bonding between the mother and the baby. MDMA has the same effect in the brain. So, well, this, this one is here. All of these are now linked to why it's good for psychotherapy. Why it, it's almost the perfect drug for trauma-focused psychotherapy. So, positive mood and creative thinking, stimulation, paradoxical relaxation, and this incredible ability to increase empathy and bonding. So, it puts you in what we call the optimal arousal zone. This is a very important concept for trauma-focused psychotherapy. If you're too under-stimulated, you won't engage with therapy. If you're too over-stimulated, you're, you dissociate. MDMA props you right in the middle there, so you've got this stimulation level which is perfect to engage. So, what studies have been done? So, Michael Mehoffer in 2010 published this study after 35 years of relentless perseverance by Rick Doblin and the guys at Max. And this is roughly how it looks. These are two hypotheses. Number one, subjects will show improved rates of PTSD. Number two, it will cause no harm. Very important hypotheses. And the way it worked was you had a baseline measurements, you had introductory non-drug sessions, three, three weekly sessions, then you had your first session with the MDMA, then four once-weekly sessions without MDMA, second dose of MDMA, four non-drug sessions, and then long-term, two months, and then, well, it's actually three and a half year follow-up. That was a very simple study. Double blind, placebo controlled study. So half the patient people got MDMA, half of them got an uh, active placebo, and then they switched them over so the placebo group could be controls for themselves in the crossover. Um, and uh, these are the results. Now, if you know anything about PTSD research, this blows out of the water the next competitive treatment traditional treatment for PTSD. So, um, in the first group, they've all got PTSD. For some reason, not fully. I'm not quite sure how those, those guys got into the study there. They all have PTSD at the beginning, both those columns. At the end, the placebo group 
uh, the, end of the, uh, the MDMA group, um, only 15% have PTSD, but the, PTSD, the placebo group, they're still up there on near 100% with PTSD. So the difference there between um, the placebo group and the, the two yellow bars is the active effect of the drug. So that's not due just to the skill of the therapist, it's an active component of the drug, because both groups got exactly the same, except one got MDMA and one got placebo. Now, if you look at the next best treatment for PTSD, which is an SSRI plus CBT therapy, it's more, it's around about 35% uh, reduction at the end of the therapy. Now, that's a really, really radical result in um, treatment for PTSD. Too radical, really, and it needs to be taken with a great deal of caution. I, if I've got a criticism, and it's not a criticism, it's massive flattery, Michael McOffer and his wife Annie are tremendously lovely, skilled, inspirational people. Um, huge hippies, and um, they will make anyone feel fantastic. So the point is, can we recreate this? Um, that's an important negative slide, it just shows that there was no neurocognitive decline or impairment, so in other words, it did no harm. That slide demonstrates that uh, it didn't cause any neurocognitive problems. Um, we'll come back to those, because uh, we got just, I've just got some, these are just some qualitative comments um, about uh, the therapy that people have been through, but I'll put those up at the end, we won't go through those. So, um, is it dangerous? Is it toxic? I mean, there is a lot of people who are concerned about MDMA, and this is really the negative influence of years of ecstasy, recreational abuse, that has been allowed to impact in a biased way on medical research. A lot of very early animal studies did suggest it was toxic, caused neurotoxicity. But there's a lot of reasons to be very cautious of those negative studies. For a start, a lot of them are done on ecstasy users. Now, I don't know what an ecstasy user is. It's somebody who goes to a club, takes a pill, plus amphetamine, cocaine, cannabis, alcohol, and whatever is in the pill. Lucky if they get some MDMA. So, any studies on an ecstasy user is a bit crap. And then we did a lot of studies with um, animals, and um, some of the studies on animals do not relate well to how the drug would be taken therapeutically. So if we assume an average ecstasy tablet has 70 milligrams of MDMA, and that's, that's not an assumption, that's a, a study that was done by John Cole. Um, he, um, he found that to be 70 milligrams, which is a really convenient figure, because that's one milligram per kilogram, a 70 kilogram amount. So, um, uh, if we assume that that's the active amount that someone's taking recreationally in a tablet of ecstasy, so we've got O'Shea's study here in 2006, he gave 12 and a half milligrams per kilogram um, to rats, and th so that's equivalent to somebody taking 12 and a half tablets of ecstasy. That doesn't relate to the way we use the drug clinically. Had submitted to do a study, he gave five milligrams twice a day for four consecutive days. So this is somebody taking 40 tablets of ecstasy in four days. You know, that's Dave King doses. Um, <laughs> he's not here. Um, <laughs> that's a joke, I just first name popped in my head. Um, and, and then we've got Sable's study here, who, his, his equivalent was somebody who consumed 160 tablets of ecstasy. But there is no relevance here to the clinical use of MDMA. Yet, the media jumped on these studies, and the pictures went all over the world of brains with holes in them, and primates, and rats, and rabbits, and, and dogs with neurotoxicity. And we heard about a huge debate raised for about 15 years. Is the cell body damaged? Is it the axon? Is there a recovery. For me, it's all irrelevant, these studies. They say nothing about the doses that we're using in psychotherapy. Um, <laughs> where is it? Um, the risks of MDMA. I mean, that it is a toxic drug. Now, don't, don't get me wrong there. Uh, I am not suggesting MDMA is a safe drug. There is no safe treatment in medicine at all. You know, sticking plasters have risks. Every single invasive treatment we do in medicine has a risk. MDMA is more risky physiologically than the classical psychedelics. Um, 
you can die from taking MDMA, pure MDMA. It can be toxic. It's not nearly as safe from a physiological point of view as LSD or some I mean, someone told me the other day, you have to consume 170 kilograms of mushrooms to die from psilocybin. So that's a serious fungi lover. <laughs> <laughs> so LSD, psilocybin, is low toxicity. MDMA does have a toxic level. It certainly does. Um, and in the UK, we've, we've heard figures of around about 20 to 40 deaths per year from, that are attributed on coroner's forms to ecstasy or MDMA. And acutely, it causes problems. It causes this bruxism, which is grinding the teeth, and or a bruxation of acute dystonia or gurning. <laughs> uh, for a while in the mid 90s, Mixed Mag had Gurner of the Month picture. I don't know if they still do that. Um, but let's look at those 20 to 40 deaths a year. So, um, Shifano did a really good study here. He looked at coroner's reports of deaths in a three year period and found 81 deaths attributed in part to ecstasy in a three year period. But if you, when he looked at those more closely, 60% of those were opiate, had also had opiates, 60% had also had alcohol in toxic doses, so measurable doses. So that leaves only six deaths in three years. So that's six deaths in three years with an estimated 300 million doses of MDMA being taken recreationally. So we're not talking about being taken in a controlled clinical setting. We're talking about kids on a Saturday night washing five pills with three pints of lager in them and snorting lines of cocaine and staying up all night and not eating and not sleeping. So this is recreational use of ecstasy. It is still, and again, I kind of put my head on the line with this, it is a remarkably safe drug. And I, I don't say that out of any biased position with any agenda to push other than the clear evidence-based data. And it's very hard to argue against that. As a psychiatrist in 1988, we were hearing, is ecstasy going to be the next epidemic? Is, are there going to be huge numbers of deaths? Are there going to be huge amounts of depression and dementia related to ecstasy? So here we are, 25 years later, of heavy MDMA use in this country. We are heavy users of MDMA. I have never seen a clinical case of an MDMA pathology. Never. They're not coming to our patients, they're not in the inpatient hospitals. They just, they just don't exist. Now, I have no doubt that for some people with a psychotic fragility, you should avoid all psychotropic drugs like this, and certainly the antipsychotics. But it, is, it has not turned out to be this terrible um, epidemic that, that we feared 25 years ago. So, I am not saying it is a safe drug, there is no such thing. Aspirin is particularly dangerous, so is paracetamol, so are sticking plasters. But it's all about the risk-benefit analysis. And that's what's so crucial. And we're going to come to that. Um, so as I said, the doses, is, the doses that were proposed in psychotherapy, we're talking 125 milligram dose. Supplemented a couple of hours later by a 62.5 milligram dose, then a four week gap, then a second dose of, the, of that magnitude. So this is equivalent to someone taking, say, one and a half tablets of ecstasy, two tablets of ecstasy, separated four weeks apart. Um, and at those doses, there is no evidence whatsoever to suggest this is going to be toxic. Andy Parrott would say otherwise. There are still some people, many of them... Oh, well, I won't say that there's a political agenda, but there are still some people who do believe that one dose of ecstasy is likely to kill you. I think... Um, the thing about, that you need to know about psychopharmacology is there are certain, there's a characteristic of a drug, an idiosyncratic um, reaction. Any drug in a particular individual with the unfortunate genetic makeup can take any particular drug and it can kill you on the spot. And there are a certain number of people who have experienced that with any drug. Um, and, uh, but that's very different from the massive, massive epidemics that are associated with drugs. So maybe some of these tragic cases where people died after taking a single ecstasy tablet, they were these one in a million, of, or three in 300 million, rather, who are, have this idiosyncratic genetic makeup that ecstasy is a deeply poisonous drug. That's a tragedy. Um, but that is the case for any drug, and that's very important. Um, so I've laid at this point, ecstasy is not MDMA, ecstasy is whatever the dealer happens to have pressed into a tablet and stamped a picture of a dove on or a Mitsubishi symbol or whatever. Um, ketamine, caffeine, BZP, heroin, brick dust, dog deworming tablets, oxygenation tablets for um, fish tanks, they've been quite popular in the mid-90s. Um, anything. Nowadays it's almost certainly going to be methadrone, which is this 
and yam, it's the finely polluted. Um, but the press and the popular media are still stuck on the idea that we should be fearful of MDMA psychotherapy because these kids over here have taken ecstasy. I really want to move us away from that position. So, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> and the answer is no. Um, <coughs> David Nutt, I was asked in 2009 to look in an unbiased way into ecstasy risks and harms and asked experts from the, all different fields, police, politicians, parents, psychopharmacologists, physicians, commoners, um, psychiatrists, to submit reports about their experience of the risks and dangers of MDMA. He collated the whole lot together and he came out with a scientific, unbiased opinion about the relative risk. He also then put that in a scale with 20 other known drugs, legal and illegal, to see where it sits. Now this is imagining all drugs were legal. So it, the legality of it didn't come into it. It was about pharmacology and toxicity. And the result was, it, LSD should become a class B drug, cannabis should become a class C, it was at the time, it should be mainly class C, um, and MDMA should become a class B. He got sacked, he wrote some violent things in the press and talked about it being safer than horse riding. Somebody put a picture of a Arabian horse onto me. <laughs> David is still vociferous on this. He will not back down. He's very adamant that it is not part of politicians to dictate medical research. It's certainly not the part of politicians to override evidence-based clinical opinions with a political agenda. Um, or at least if that is the part, then let's be transparent about that's what's happened. So here's this rational scale of harms and uh, risks. So the, the bars in red means that's their, that they're currently in class A. So if the scale for drugs was really good, all the red ones should be up that end, because that's the more harmful. Now, heroin and cocaine, they got it right. They are really harmful, and they are class A. But the real worries are the ones down this end that are red, and particularly ecstasy. It's, you know, it's below cannabis, tobacco, alcohol, benzodiazepines, you know, I, I think, I, I gave a seven-year-old benzodiazepines schemes yesterday. Um, that's my job. This is our drug to all in this country. It is not fit for purpose, so that's their just common And, you know, I'm not here to talk about recreational drug use. I've got strong opinions on it, but I kind of stay clear of that argument because um, I'm more interested in these drugs being licensed for medical use, and in, so that reason I have to stay clear of the recreational argument. But it is relevant here for me, in as much as the fact that ecstasy is class A makes it very difficult to do research. So here's the risk-benefit argument. In medicine, we do some horrifically invasive things in the name of treatment. And we, every single time you see a patient, you do this risk-benefit argument. Will, it, will the benefits outweigh the cost? And if you can satisfy the argument, then you do. If I put that plaster on that person, it's going to hurt when I take it off. Is it worth it? Yes, it is, because they've got to stop that cut. So you do a risk analysis. If I give this person chemotherapy and all their hair's going to fall out, and they could actually die, is that worth it? Yes, it is, because they're probably going to die anyway if we don't do it. It's a risk-benefit analysis, and you do that for every single treatment in, in medicine. And so you've got intractable PTSD that has not been treated by other, by other methods. Can we give this person 125 milligrams of MDMA in a cl clinical controlled setting safely? And is that worth it? Because will it potentially treat this lifelong condition that has not been treated by other things? For me, that absolutely satisfies the risk-benefit analysis by a very, very long way. And that's the point. Yet, there's a little niggling argument down here that says, but what about ecstasy? And that is incredibly irritating <coughs> as a doctor who's interested in the evidence-based objective science of it. Incredibly irritating that MDMA was ever a recreational drug. And my colleagues who are developing drugs for cardiac problems or renal problems, <coughs> they don't have this stuff. They, they develop these drugs. No one's excited about some new renal drug if that's going to work. But they just, you know, they do the toxicology studies, it's safe, it works, bang, they go, it's licensed. And here we are with the drug, it's going through the same studies, and then it hits this wall called the Daily Mail. 
<laughs> where <laughs> suddenly says we don't care about all of those experts and all those toxicology studies. We, we're not, we're uncomfortable about this. They don't say that to my colleagues in renal medicine, it's bloody frustrating. <laughs> so, there we are, we're throwing the baby out of the bathwater if we're ignoring MDMA therapy. Um, right, okay, so probably not. So what's next? And uh, I'll draw to a close. So, we've got Mitthofer's study published in 2010, 35 years after MDMA was banned. We've got a whole load of studies that are in the process or almost started and didn't happen. So far, at this point in time, we've only got one study, it's a Mitthofer study. Um, there's another study going on in Switzerland with uh, Peter Owen, and uh, that's all finished. They've finished treating the patients, and the data's in, and it's uh, being written up now. Um, we haven't talked about anxiety associated with advanced stage cancer, but that's another area, as well as PTSD, where uh, MDMA and other psychedelic drugs could have great uses. So that's kind of on, all on in the pipeline. Um, Mithoff is concentrating in his second study now with specifically veterans of war. Um, and then this intern study is interesting. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. And then uh, these, are all, these are all studies that MAX, Rick Doblin at the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, MAX, they're all studies that MAX are pushing. So we're looking at studies in lots of different countries, Australia, Canada as well. They're all phase two studies, so they're small patients with you know, 20 to 40 patients. Um, you have to do, the way you do pharmacology research is you have phase one toxicology studies which are done on healthy subjects, or before then you have preclinical studies on animals. If they're okay, you move on to phase two, which is these studies, 20 to 40 patients um, with a clinical problem, so they're clinical studies. Then you move on to phase three, when you roll it out over a larger number of people, sort of 600 to 1,000, so a couple of thousand patients if you can. And then you go on to the uh, open label use of the drug on tens of thousands. So the long term picture for MDMA as a licensed drug, I would say five to 15 years, maybe eight, depending on the regulatory authorities, but we could have MDMA in the form of it. And I've almost finished. This is. Um, what we're trying to do. Now, one thing, I, I mentioned this, that Michael Mitthofer is a very inspirational guy, but if this is going to work, if it's going to be funded, if it's going to be costed, if this is going to be in a nice guideline treatment for PTSD, we can't only show that it's done on 20 people by some really experienced MDMA therapist. We have to show that your bog standard NHS psychologist or psychotherapist with minimal training can deliver MDMA PTSD therapy, and that's what we're looking at doing in Cardiff. So, um, John Bisson is the, the college lead on PTSD in the country. He's got a large trauma clinic, including about 50% combat veterans. He gets like 140 referrals a year, so he's got a good population of patients. And we're designing a study that is intentionally removing a lot of the transpersonal approach. Um, it's much more rigid, it's much more systematic and regimented, which might upset some people and might not work actually, might not work. But if we're going to roll this out as an NHS delivered treatment, it has to be done in this way, because otherwise, you know, there are thousands, tens of thousands of people with PTSD that need this treatment. So that's what we're looking at. We're, all, we're going to do um, MRI scans pre and post as well. And the, well, the state we're at at the moment is um, we're writing the protocol, we're going to submit that, um, looking for funders. Um, interestingly, the, uh, the Royal Legion, the British Royal Legion, um, are interested because they are desperate for something for PTSD. Um, so that's a potential funder. So the hope is that within the next few months we'll have an idea about funding and then we're looking at a three year project to treat uh, patients with PTSD with our um, psychotherapy study. Um, and you may could be useful for other things. Um, could be useful for depression and anxiety, couples therapy, anxiety associated with end-stage cancer. Um, could be an alternative to ECT. One of the things, one of the reasons we use ECT, and ECT, um, let me tell you, is a very useful treatment for psychiatry. There's another treatment with a negative press for the wrong reasons. ECT is cheap, clean, quick, effective, and safe. And it is a helpful drug, um, use uh, physical treatment in psychiatry that saves lives. 
We don't, it's massively underused in this country because of the negative press. Um, it's used much more in other countries where it's effective and people don't have to sit on drugs all the time. The reason we use ECT is when we need a rapid response. The SSRI to antidepressant medication takes about four to six weeks to start working. You've got a suicidal patient who's catatonic or they're not eating or drinking because they've got such severe depression. You use ECT and uh, they recover very quickly. And maybe MDMA has a role there. Where MDMA floods the receptors with serotonin. Maybe it can have a similar effect. Maybe it can be the drug that replaces ECT. I would be fascinated to know what happens if you give a severely depressed patient a high-dose MDMA session. I think it would be like ECT. I think you would see a what we call a reaction on the end of the needle type effect. Um, but um, I have approached uh, the guy that runs our local ECT clinic, but uh, he wasn't too interested. So maybe if it's sold as MDMA could be the nail in the coffin for ECT, that would have a lot of popular support. Okay, and of course, there are plenty of people in the psychedelic community who say, why should the doctors be running the show here? Um, these drugs have important uses for psychospiritual development. We should have these places. We should be able to go to a clinic and take MDMA and psilocybin and ayahuasca, DMT. Um, Tree hugging, that's my vision. <laughs> um, and uh, why not? I don't know. I mean, again, that's not an argument I should allow myself to drift into. But I, I do believe that these drugs have beneficial uses in the non clinical population for psych spiritual development. Um, you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> so there's a number of studies in the psychedelic renaissance, a number of groups in the psychedelic renaissance that are pushing, pushing, pushing. Back to the foundation, but Amanda's not here, is she? Yes. Is she? Um, Bexley Foundation is this country's leading, um, leading proponent of consciousness research and psychedelic therapy, um, backing a lot of the studies going on at the Imperial University. Um, Max has talked about a lot. Um, recent conferences, that's our weird looking conference there. That's the, the Breaking Convention Conference, World Psychedelic Forum in Europe, HEFTA. Um, so we've got an uh, um, explosion, a mushrooming of interest in psychedelic research in the last five years or so. I'm going to finish with Freud. Um, Freud made this statement that one day we might be able to augment our psychotherapy with chemicals. This was a distant dream in the 30s when he wrote this. Um, he was a neurologist, so I think Freud would have been really keen on psychedelic drugs. I think he would have seen them as tools to enhance the psychoanalytical process. Um, and I think he would have been very keen on MDMA. He liked the okay. um, Interestingly, Jung, who has been very much embraced by the psychedelic community because of all his talk around the, the collective unconsciousness and the archetypes and the cross-cultural dimension that Jung talked about so deeply, he's a, he's a real sort of favourite in the psychedelic community. He, he didn't like psychedelics, he wasn't keen on them at all, didn't think they were very helpful. He did know that. <laughs> but Freud, I think, would have liked them. So, we have a good history of research in this country, and we need to revisit it. We need to be really responsible. We know MDMA is not safe, is not a 100% safe drug, there aren't any. But it can be used safely. We need to be boring, unfortunately. We need to cut our hair. And we need to be boring, grey-suited doctors. <laughs> because, unfortunately, that's the approach we have to take. It is unhelpfully linked in with recreational drug abuse. And from that unhelpful linking in comes all the negative media attention. But if we can do this, and if we can, if we can sell this to the population, that it needn't be controversial, this is medicine, this is evidence-based medicine, then we owe it to the population, the patients that we work with, to give it a shot. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. We've got a little bit of time for some questions. We have a, a number of people in the audience who also have a lot of experience and, and wealth of knowledge on this matter, even uh, done MDMA psychotherapy um, as therapists. So I'll open up and, uh, the floor for questions. I'll just say to Ben, first of all, I'm intrigued to think, what do your colleagues make of this? What do uh, um, the psychiatrists think? Uh, it's uh, overwhelmingly extremely positive. The first reaction is, 
curiosity. Like, that's weird. I didn't even know that field of medicine existed. That's the first thing. I've had a few comments along the way that this is career suicide, don't do this. But that's, yeah, that couldn't have been more wrong. I mean, when I started doing this seven years ago, since then I've spoken internationally, I've published papers, and that's way above the other people of my contemporaries. So it's actually opened up loads of doors. Um, but I think it's worked because I've taken this very straight-laced attitude. You know, that I talk about this hiatus of research in the last 40 years. It hasn't been a total hiatus. And the hippies have been flying the freak flag high for the last 40 years. But unfortunately, the doctors haven't. So if we're going to get it, get this transpersonal psychotherapy back in, we've got to do it gently. So I think people respect the fact that I've got this kind of gentle, professional approach. <laughs> <laughs> we have some questions from the floor. Please. Yeah, just uh, the back here. Hi, can you can speak up as well? There is a microphone. Oh yeah, we've got a microphone. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just um, I thought it was really interesting. I just had a few questions on the published study, if that's okay. Yes. And um, so the placebo group, did they go through exactly the same protocol as the MDMA group apart from the MDMA? Group? Yes. So, yeah. Why were the remission rates so low? Because I thought your average rate of um, remission just from a standard therapy course was much higher than that for PTSD. Uh, I think that's about standard, about 25% placebo response is, is a pretty standard response for, for psychotherapy. And I'm sorry, just wondering, sorry, this, you didn't say the sample size of the population or where it was published. Just, the the Mithoffer study. Yeah. Um, the sample size was 20 patients. Um, crossed over, so they, they all had placebo or MDMA, and then those that got placebo were then given the opportunity to have open label MDMA. So it's 20 patients. It's small, it's a pilot study. Um, there were very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. They couldn't be dependent on any drugs. They could have had some past drug history, but they couldn't be dependent on any drugs or currently using any drugs. They had to come off their psychiatric medication for the course of the study. Um, they had to not have a personal or family history of psychosis, they can be pregnant, physical, they have to be physically well. So those the sort of standard inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, all adults, 18 to 65, I think, e equal group of males and females, I think. Which is that which journal? Um, Mithoff's study was journal of psychopharmacology. So the follow-up study is coming out in Journal of Psychology in the next few months. I reviewed it the other day, so that's coming out. That's a long-term follow-up for you. I have one question, please. Um, no worries, uh, thank you very much. Uh, when you had your uh, slides up for the time scale, uh, you had one session and then four weeks between that were non-MDMA and then another yeah. MDMA. So the course of the session was 10 weeks? Um, the, um, the total course of the of the psychotherapy the study was, um, well, it's like, there you are. <coughs> Baseline measurements, three week introductory sessions. So that's three weeks, the fourth week MDMA, four long, that's eight weeks, nine weeks plus another four, it's getting on for 16 weeks by the end of it. And how long would a, like a normal therapy um, kind of take with kind of standard CBT? Well, it, there's a, of a wide variety, but 16 weeks is about, is about normal. Exactly but, the same for yeah, it's, it's comparative to some of the other CBT <coughs> studies and the other drug studies as well. Okay, thank you. <coughs> that's it on that way, then. Um, so you mentioned about the, the daily mail brick walls that you hit. Um, presumably, um, as doctors, you can give people drugs that are illegal anyway, right? So, so you mean we can use like morphine? Or something. Yes, yes. So, so, so how does the daily mail brick wall actually kind of stop this kind of research go go on? It, it makes it very difficult to do studies. It makes it very difficult to get a license to do these studies. You have to get ethical approval and. You might, like, you might imagine that the ethics board are unbiased by public opinion, but they're not. Um, the, the truth of the fact, as we saw with David, is there is a, a media and political influence upon medical research, there just is. And so 
that's, that's, where, that's where it gets stuck. It's got an awful lot better in the last few years. And I think it's going to snowball now, because now we've got data on the table. It's taken 35 years to get that on the table. Now we can say, there it is. Hopefully there'll be many, many more coming. Is there, is there a way you could just change the name? Like, you can just don't call it MDMA. Well, uh, yeah, that, it's got connotations, and that's what the press jump on it. It's very yeah. like, you know, you called it by its first initials of those who were covering the foot. I, I don't think you can't change the name MDMA because that's chemical. That's its chemical name. I mean, it's almost similar things happen in terms of the studies with psilocybin nowadays. Loads of studies going on with psilocybin, and researchers could have used LSD. In fact, wanted to in a lot of cases, but found that it's much easier to. Get, get research for psilocybin because it doesn't have this, you know, people hear those three letters, LSD, and it's terrifying. A lot of people don't know that psilocybin is magic mushroom. So, um, that, that is almost what's happened in some space. I can't think of a, a decent analogue other than MDMA that isn't MDMA that's going to do the job. But, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of changing the name, let's not call it ecstasy anymore. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you about the type of psychotherapy that's being used in, in yeah. this study, for instance. Um, is it, can you say something about that? Yeah, um, this might be a good chance for me to, to, um, to ask Friedrich and Conrad about their experience, but Michael Mithoffer's study, um, it, the actual, during the course of the drug experience, it was relatively unguided at the beginning. So there was several hours of lying back with eye shades on during the initial, um, uh, intoxication with the drugs. It's quite a quick, it's quite a heavy uh, uptake, the, the rush of, of taking the tablet. Um, and then when that died down after a few hours, then the eye shade would come off and there'd be um, the explorative trauma, post trauma work. It was always relatively unguided, so it wasn't structured like CBT, like now we're going to talk about this. It would be what the patient wanted to bring, which was really the purpose of the preparatory session. So they'd have these three weeks before to talk about what they wanted to talk about. And they learn about the MDMA experience and what to expect. And then the material that comes out in the MDMA session would then be talked about and integrated in the following non-drug sessions. So in answer to your question, what was the form of psychotherapy during the drug session? Relatively unguided. I mean, the whole course of it, the, the, I'm a psychotherapist, and I'm just wondering what type of psychotherapy, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm not familiar with the transpersonal approach. It, it has a lot of similarities to the transpersonal approach. Can I ask that this is a good opportunity, Friedrich, for you yes. to say a thing or two? So, yes. you introduce yourself. Yes, so, okay. Yeah, I'm Friedrich, and um, I used to do, to do um, for a couple of years, um, underground uh, psychotherapy um, with MDMA and LSD and other substances. And unfortunately, we were caught and put in into um, in jail. In jail. <laughs> in jail. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I'm, on, I'm I'm not in jail anymore. Uh, but um, we are. On, I'm on probation. And my husband is off probation already. But I can tell you what we did. Um, we, uh, we we had a quite long and it, should, should I stand up? Uh, it's, it's up to you. Really. It's easier. We had quite a long introduction series because we first taught our clients uh, to to learn how to be with the substance because uh, I think it's a pretty hard work for the client and the therapist to go directly uh, onto the the trauma. You first have to really learn how to, how to be with a substance, and then uh, on the session uh, itself, you first lay down for one and a half or uh, two hours, and then uh, the, the more the client knows how to work with the substance, then you can, especially with the MDMA, focus on something that you put your intention on. But this you have to learn. Uh, in between and on the session itself again and again to focus uh, on what you want to see and then stick with what you uh, want the, what the client looks at and then you guide him just uh, by holding him or whatever he needs you guide him through because he is totally out of fear when the substance really works and when he knows how to uh, be with the substance and then he can look and sort of relive 
uh, but from a distance. With the LSD, you are right in it. So with the MDMA, it gives you the very good distance uh, to the trauma, and you can sort of look at it at different angles. You can look at it, and you can even look at the perpetrator and um, sort of understand the the, um, the, the contact, uh, the, the binding between the perpetrator and the victim. And in this way, you, you sort of go over the whole thing and can look at it like a, a viewer. And uh, while, while the therapist holds you or uh, uh, says, tells you things like, it's over now, look at me, say it's over, and uh, then you can look at the trauma again, and again you look at the therapist. So step by step, you try to, to get a situation where the victim can look at the whole thing without a reaction anymore. And this uh, is this is when a very good outcome. In the beginning, really, you have to learn. Uh, you you have to, to see that it is not done in one session. You know, sometimes it, I had I have done it for a couple. Of, we have done it for a couple of years, and with some clients. After the 20th session, finally the trauma came up. So, uh, in, in a study like this, I think one really has to, uh, to prepare the client to really um, focus on this very thing, because uh, me, as underground worker, I didn't have a limit, you know. I got the limit then. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. nice effect of the MDMA. I mean, people have, I've put up some of the qualitative reports, but people talk about it as if it's like a, a life jacket or a bulletproof vest that they can go into battle with. It doesn't mean you don't experience the negative effect, because you certainly do. And some of the patients said, I don't know why they call this ecstasy. You know, it's, you're there to do some hardcore trauma work, and it, it's painful. But what the MDMA does is give you a cushion to look at those traumatic memories that you can't do without it. So you still feel the pain, it's just not as much. May, may I add something? <coughs> I, I think uh, it depends somewhat on the se severeness of the trauma. Uh, very, very, uh, I, I, I happen to talk to uh, the uh, leader of the Swiss um, study and uh, they had very heavy cases on post-traumatic stress disorder. And they found out that when the trauma is very, very heavy, uh, in the first or two s sessions, the clients don't feel anything. They say, I don't feel anything, because the uh, resistance is so hard that even uh, with the MMA, you don't get immediately to it. So uh, then, then we can really see uh, that with when the dissociation is so big, we can't reach it uh, with one or two or three sessions. Got time for just one or two questions, and I would love to uh, okay. to that. But, yeah. I'm around, and I'm happy to talk. Yeah, to but you. we can stay around for another half hour after that, and have a glass of wine and cool off a little bit. But just uh, two, one or two more questions, and then we'll play. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as, as far as a scientific study, you've laid it out brilliantly, you know, and, and, and the same with Matt and the Beckley Foundation. But as you said, the, the main problem is a political one. And it, in a sense, it's going to take a really, really long time before that, that changes slowly. Um, at, at what point can, can you envisage, I mean, uh, you, you hinted at the psycho-spiritual effects, and it seems at some point that the, the reason there's a political problem is society is still hung up on the possibility of seeing anything in terms of a spiritual or anthropologicalism or societal. Are there any other possibilities for studies that can be done or permission in an, on an anthropological kind of level, on a sociological level? Is there any way that you could add some scientific weight to that? Uh, I mean, I think. Can you ask that? Yeah, I think yeah. Like, you're kind of talking about the kind of way, like, uh, is it uh, Celia Morgan's been doing research where they go around to people's houses where they're taking the, the, the psychedelics at home yeah. and doing kind of scientific research yeah. with people? It, it, like field research, is that what you're talking about? Well, well, kind of, but I'm also saying that they, at some point, rather than. I mean, I've understood because of what happened in the 60s and the cultural reasons. 
they, that science had to separate itself from that. But it seems to me at some point, they have to come back round to acknowledging that that exists. Because so that's always going to be in the back of Can we mind. push forward the agenda for not just clinical uses of these drugs, but healthy people taking them for psychospiritual reasons? Absolutely. Yeah. That would be great. But um, Where is the method? It would be very hard, and I think we've got to crack the medical people first. Um, as, as I said, it's, it, I, I, it's not shared with everyone's view, but my view is if we're going to move this forward from the medical point of view, we've got to separate it from the recreational view. I personally have a very strong feeling that the war on drugs is not fit for its purpose and that these drugs should be legalised for safe, adult, non-clinical recreational use. That's my personal feeling. I can't say that's part of my work clinically because I think that might damage that. So, but that happened yeah. in the 60s. Yeah, that happened, happened in the 60s. But it, it wasn't just the pop stars and the poets who were taking LSD, it was the doctors as well. Yeah. So, it, you know, I got to stay clear, clear of that argument. And um, I, I think, yeah, absolutely, I thoroughly think that psychedelic drugs can be very positive for personal psych spiritual growth. But the trouble is, they have to be taken with so much care and attention that you can't be having kids at raves taking them for... It's difficult to argue that they're doing it for psych spiritual growth. I think they are, yeah. in a lot of cases, but it's kind of difficult to sell that to the authorities. Absolutely. So we've probably got to do it in the clinical arena first. Can I ask you last question? Please? It's difficult to sell to the authorities. With the MK Ultra, mm -hmm. you talk about in the 50s when they were looking at it as a potential truth serum. Yeah. Do, you, do we know what their what their reported findings were? What their findings were besides their drugs and MKH? Poor. Poor. They didn't really use any. Because what they found was it's LSD, particularly in the MK Ultra program, is so unpredictable. It didn't really work how they wanted it to work. They didn't pay attention to the set and setting. They um, didn't get the kind of reproducible results that they hoped for, so it was dropped, thankfully. And there was just, can we just drop a couple more quick questions in front yeah. of you? I'll give you the mic. Yeah. 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 Um, I wondered whether any of the people taking part in the studies experienced um, a mood crash the following day. Is that something? Um, Often yeah, it's interestingly the whole Blue Tuesday or Blue Wednesday or yeah. Black Sunday and all the various things that we call um, is not really borne out clinically nearly as much, interestingly, which actually says that it's probably not a psychological <coughs> aspect of the drug. We know there's massive serotonin depletion, which then has to build up over a few days. So we know that happens, but interestingly, when you take it clinically, you don't see it nearly as much, which probably shows that the reason people get a Black Tuesday is because they've been up all night, they haven't eaten, they've drunk far too much, they haven't slept, they've got to go back to work, they've got crap. <laughs> so, whereas when you turn up at the clinic and you take it at 9 o'clock in the morning after a good night's sleep, and you work really hard, and you, you're down by the evening, and you have a meal, and you go to bed, you interestingly don't get the same crash. I think you do a little bit, but Mick Hoffer, I asked him that. You don't see it. So that is therefore probably due to the, the lifestyle in which it's taken, more so than the pharmacology, but pharmacologists might say otherwise. And I think there is a certain serotonin crash, but it's not nearly as bad as a hangover. It's uh, more reason for having it used in psychotherapy then. Uh, everybody, thank you very much for coming. Please do come back to the Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness lecture series. Um, talk next one to cosmic, co cosmic Consciousness and the thing Robin... Actually, um, can I just have a quick plug here, because Robin is doing a research study doing a brain scanning and uh, using MDMA in the brain scan, and it's still looking for participants. Can I, is it alright to stay, Robin, can you stick your hand up? It's hiding right at the back, if you're interested in taking part in that research. Maybe I'll sort of just uh, put his email up on the uh, Facebook site. And he's still doing some science study, but I'm doing it on Friday. Right. So, uh, Robin, I think you've got all the time to do the Japanese. Uh, for the rest of the year. Thank you, everybody. And until we.